Hey everybody, this is Wanda Alger and today is Friday, October 7. How can a good God allow such evil to exist? That's an age old question people have been talking about and debating for generations. Recently, I suggested that question is gonna come up again in a very real way. As exposures uh, begin to happen and truth comes out about the real dark, dark things that have been going on for many, many years. There's gonna be a whole new batch of people who are gonna be asking this question because it's no longer gonna be just a theological debate or a philosophical uh, quandary. No, it's going to be right in our face, seeing wickedness like we've never seen it before. And especially many non-believers, those who are looking for a reason to deny God are gonna be asking this question. I got several emails lately from some folks who also brought this up and really wanted me to speak into it. And so I went to the Lord and I, I just dug deep and I saw some things, I found some things that I hadn't seen before. And so I wanna take you on a little journey here in a process that I went through in trying to get a handle on how to respond to that question and how to view the things that we're gonna be dealing with in the days to come. And I realized very first that before we can even ask the question, how can God allow such evil? There was another question that I thought was much more important that I rarely hear in these arguments. And that is if God is omniscient and he knows everything, he sees past, present, future, and he's already seen, he saw the wickedness that was going to happen. Why did he go ahead and create the beings that would unleash such wickedness? That really requires you to, to dig deep because you have to really begin to ask what compels him. You really have to know his heart. Why would a God go ahead with a plan like this? Now, if you've been following me, I actually have written another article a couple of weeks ago that started to address this called the greatest devolution of all time. And I'll put the link below. But what I'm going to share with you here in this video, it's a little bit new. I'm going to build on that a little bit, okay? So the very first thing in trying to understand this question is the reality of God as the creator. And I'm going through scripture, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna pull out some scripture verses because to me, that's, that's the plumb line. That's the basis for truth. Well, the fact is God did create everything and it started out good. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So not only does that indicate that God created everything, not just humans, but I mean the, the entire cosmos, rulers, principalities, I mean everything that we see, he created it and it was through him and for him. And if you look at the uh, creation account in Genesis, I mean, you go through there after every day that he created something, it was good. It was good. At the end of the seventh day, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. That's Genesis 131. Now understand that that wasn't just the earth and the creation, but even Nehemiah 9, 6 also says, you are the Lord, you alone, you have made the heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it. Now, now why is that important? Well, because I had to right away think about Lucifer. I mean, he is the prince of darkness. He's the one that's causing all of this. So again, getting back to my question, how did God, how could God have gone ahead and created this angelic being who would end up rebelling? Well, here again, if we're going to talk about that God's creation was good, believe it or not, Lucifer was created good. Uh, Ezekiel 28 references how God intended for Lucifer to be. Ezekiel 28, starting verse 12, it says, and this is God speaking to him. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. This is Lucifer. 
not only was he a favored cherub, he was ordained as the guardian in the Garden of Eden. God entrusted Lucifer with the most sacred treasures of all, mankind, man and woman. Lucifer was put there. And so this is saying, God created it. God created Lucifer blameless. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Okay, so here, if someone would ask, well, how could God create evil? He didn't create evil. He did create Lucifer, who was perfect, blameless in all his ways. That's how God created him. It was Lucifer's choice, not God's. It was Lucifer's choice to rebel. He got full of himself. And because of his, his beauty, his knowledge, his wisdom, he became jealous of God. He wanted to be his own God. If you go in Isaiah 14, 12, it references this as well. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet, says God, you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. God already determined Lucifer's demise because of his rebellion. So obviously God did not create evil. He created beings with the choice to do good and evil. And therein lies the challenge. And you've heard the arguments about free will, okay? Well, let's explore that just a little deeper because we're going to find that God has dealt with this time and time again. The risk that he took in giving man free will. Now, let's just take a look here at what led Lucifer to his downfall. We've talked about it. There's something more, and I found a quote by Andrew Womack, a well-known Bible teacher. He said, so what made Lucifer turn against God? Lucifer watched as God did something for man that he had never done with any of his other creation. When God created man, not only was he made in the very image of God, but he was then given unconditional authority on the earth. Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Lucifer saw Adam and Eve have something he was never given. I mean, jealousy filled his heart. And they were given a place to rule. This is what Lucifer wanted. And thus, this is what Lucifer still once. He is determined to have his own domain. It's always pride, jealousy, and rebellion that gives birth to evil in both humans as well as heavenly beings. God made the angels, the cherubim, all of the heavenly beings with the same choice in whom they served. I mean, it's incredible to think, why would God do that? Such risky business. And yet he does it for love because he knows the only way that his creation can choose him for love is to have the freedom to choose it. Otherwise, we would just be pre-programmed robots. That's the essence of love is the freedom to choose. That's a reflection on God's heart. We're going to look at that more. Obviously, Lucifer made the wrong choice. But he wasn't satisfied with it because he wanted to take man and woman down as well. So, of course, we know the story of the fall. In Genesis 3, to 3, 4, and 5, he appeared as a serpent to Eve. You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, this is, this is a part of being made in his image. 
I mean, you think about it. Why did God create us in his image? He, he wants us to have the same capacity that he does. When he breathed his spirit into us, he breathed his DNA. He breathed into us his seed, a seed of greatness, of goodness, of pure love. That's what he put in us. That's why we are made in his image. And he, like a loving father, wants us to have this capacity within us for great things. I mean, just like a good dad wants his sons and daughters to succeed and flourish and expand. That's the heart of our loving God. He desires that for us. And that's what he placed in us from the very beginning. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve made the wrong choice because they took Lucifer's bait and they fell. They too were expelled from the garden. I mean, this was a reality check of the risk that God took in giving them a free will to choose. But yet, what did he do? Did he take away then their choice? I mean, realize they what they started, it, it opened the door for all of mankind now because the curse uh, was unleashed because of what they had done. Did he then choose to say, okay, I can't, we can't do this anymore? Of course not, because we have to remember he's seen this all ahead of time. No, he knew he did not want to take away that choice, but he needed to put safeguards in place. Well, this has been the story ever since. God is, he's had to deal with this time and time again, because even after the fall in the garden, Fast forward about 1,600 years, and we find ourselves in the days of Noah. And of course, what happened in the days of Noah? Genesis 6, 5 to 8, just a few chapters later, says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I have made them. I don't know if you ever saw that scripture before. Now understand this doesn't imply that God didn't know what would happen. Okay. Scripture as we read it is not just, meant to be read as a book of laws and rules, methods and principles. It's written so that we get to know his heart. If you read throughout scripture, God expresses himself a lot. He is full of emotion, passion, anger, zeal, love. He purposely shares this way, expresses himself through the whole biblical narrative so that we can relate to him and he's reminding us, you're made in my image. You too have this capacity to feel deeply and to know the goodness that there can be. And so in this passage, he's just helping us to get in touch with this understanding. I mean, it pained him to see it, even though he knew it. I remember in the New Testament, when Jesus wept, you know, when he was standing before the tomb of Lazarus? He came there because he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Why did he weep? Again, this should be a reflection on God's heart. He feels deeply. Lest people think that God is void of emotion or deep love and compassion, it's the exact opposite. He feels deeply. And this is what he's expressing here. And by this time, who knows how many millions of people were on the earth? I'm sure there's ways you can figure that out through the genealogies. But the whole earth, it said, was filled with wickedness. He said the intention of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. We think it's bad now. I mean, we see the New Testament references that say, as in the days of Noah. But yet, it almost seems like this was even worse because God was ready to wipe them out. He saw the wickedness and, and he saw everything had been corrupted. Everything had been corrupted. And he was ready to deal with it, to destroy everything. But Noah 
found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Now let me read, because I've posted this in an article today on, on my blog. In the middle of the mayhem and mess of a world gone bad stood one righteous man. Though millions had chosen otherwise, there was one man that stood out, and it moved God's heart. One man loved God with purity and humility. One man believed God's promise for a better world and refused to make the wrong choice. Just as God was about to wipe out everything he had made, this one man stopped him. In Noah, God saw what he had been waiting for, that seed of greatness, that seed from his own heart his own creation expressing the goodness of the Father and choosing to trust him with pure and simple faith. It was this seed of faith that reignited God's plan. Even though he could justify the destruction of his entire creation due to their rebellion, he relented. That which he had first breathed into man was still at work and still bringing life. Through one righteous man, the world was saved. Now, I want to stop at this point. This has such application. As I was reading this, don't ever doubt the power of your prayers to move God's heart. One man in a world of millions, one person stood out because of pure and simple faith in God, purity, humble before the Lord, and that was enough. If we ever think, oh, we've just got to have more in our numbers, and then maybe something can change. That's not always true. This, this is God's heart, because when he sees that seed of faith, oh, it moves his heart, and he will respond. And sure enough, God saved Noah and his family. Yes, he did release his wrath on the rest of the creation that refused to listen but the world was saved. And then in Genesis 8, it talks about Noah's response. It says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, see, it, that, sacri that was a sacrifice. I mean, you have to understand, what all did Noah lose? I mean, he had his family. And, and provision, but the world as they had known it was totally gone. That was, that was a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, and the Lord knew it, and that too, it pleased his heart. It moved his heart, and it, it filled him with his passion, and it said, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. But never will I again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. In declaring his covenant to mankind, God let all the powers and authorities know his intentions. Even though evil still existed, it didn't change his plan. It didn't matter that men could still be corrupted by Lucifer's agendas. It was clear that even in the midst of the worst kind of sin, God's goodness would prevail. Where Lucifer would seek to bring out the worst of God's creation, God would bring out the best. In the choice between good and evil, God's seed would always prevail because his love will always conquer Lucifer's hate. In that passage, if you read of God's response to Noah, he reiterated the creation mandate. He told Noah, be fruitful, multiply. I have not changed my mind about my sons and daughters ruling on the earth. And interestingly enough, if you follow this story, he also put something else in place. And it's, it's a, hidden in there. It's in Genesis 9, 1 to 6, because God is talking about blood that is spilt. He says, for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, 
I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Now, why does this stand out to me? There's already a reference earlier in the creation story. When Cain killed Abel, Abel cried out. And he said, the voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. But God was the one that dealt with it. From this point on with Noah, now he gave Noah, he gave mankind the authority to deal with wickedness. I, I could just feel as I was reading it, the, the passion of the Lord wanting so much to bless those who were faithful and who were obedient. And he was like, I trust you, Noah, and I give you the authority to deal with this wickedness. Now, obviously, you know, this is all Old Testament and after the cross, because Jesus shed his blood, sin is covered. Okay. And so an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that's no longer there. But my point is of God's determination to fulfill the mandate and the commission that he gave you and I, regardless of the evil that's there. Continue on through the biblical narrative. I mean, this is a continual theme of God wanting his people to make the right choice, even in the midst of harsh things. This is one of the reasons why he raised up prophets was to continue to call the people back to righteousness and holiness and to make that right choice. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, Moses, who was a prophet to Israel, he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. This was the cry from the father's heart through his prophets to his people, choose life. Choose goodness, even in the midst of evil. Lucifer has never let up because he's hoping if he can bring man to his knees through suffering, he wants us to deny that God is a good God, that he is God. In the story of Job, we've heard that through the ages. And if you read that again, here is Job. God saw in Job the same thing he saw in Noah, a man after his own heart. And if you read that story, it was God himself who pointed out Job to Satan because God knew what, he, what Satan was trying to do. But God knew he recognized that seed within his sons and daughters. And he knew what was in Job's heart. And so he even told Job, and you can find this in Job 1.1. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. God has such confidence in Job. And of course, the whole, the whole book of Job is, you know, his friends trying to come and, and figure this all out, all the philosophers of the age of why, you know, why he's sick, why everything has been destroyed, why he's lost everything. And the whole time, this is, this is my perspective on it. The whole time, I have a feeling God is up there. He knows what's in Job, but Job doesn't realize it. And this whole time, he's just waiting for Job to realize, no, my God is good. My God, I can trust. And he is faithful. Because by the end of, of the story, then we see Job gets it. Because he refuses to deny that God is a good God, even in the midst of this. And the other part of this, which is going to come into my last point that I, I wanted to share, is that from God's vantage point, God knew ahead of time, because he sees this all ahead of time, he knew how Job's life would finish. I mean, you read in the story, and it says that the second half of Job's life, I mean, everything was restored to him, all of his wealth, all of his accumulations, he had more children, and he lived a long and full life. Well, you could say, yeah, but what about his first set of children? He lost those. But see here, this is where we have to think like God. Because in eternity's perspective, if Job's first set of children were following after God, they're in heaven with him. He didn't lose anything, not by earthly standards. In eternity, he has gained it all. Not only did he li live a full and rich life on the earth, he has gone down in history as one who has remained faithful. His testimony is is timeless. 
This is how God sees things. And this, if we're going to understand how do we view the pain and suffering, the kinds of things that, that we're going to be privy to and realize have been going on, we have to get outside of our time and space continuum. And we have to realize that God operates from a totally different vantage point than what we do. We have to see eternity as God does. That this existence here in our life, it's but a blip on his radar. That's hard. We can't comprehend it. You know, I, to even try to explain it, there's, there's very few words because we don't live in that realm. We don't exist in that realm, but he does. I mean, we have scriptures that bear this out. You know, 2 Corinthians 4, this is from the Apostle Paul, you know, who was speaking to a church who were, they were going through persecution. Who knows exactly what, to what degree? But he said, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction. Now, who knows what kinds of affliction that would have been? At the very least, they were being persecuted. And yes, some of them were being killed. He said, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They're temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. This is where my hope and my faith rests. Because it's clear in scripture. There is going to be hardship. You, you can't be a follower of Christ without going through some suffering. He, he said that numerous times to his disciples. And in the epistles, you see the same thing. Even the early church. I mean, people have been killed for their faith. This is a part of what it means to follow Christ. But if we only fix ourselves on how we understand life in, in our understanding of time, it, it's going to feel like there's no hope. But if we look in the light of eternity and what God is achieving, the glory that's going to come, and I believe the grace that's even there, even for victims, even for those who have gone through tremendous pain, see, God himself knows it only takes a moment in his presence to be supernaturally healed, restored, happy, full of joy, for, full of love. I absolutely believe that even at this point, all who have gone before, who have been tortured, abused, uh, treated wrongly, those who are now in heaven, I believe by God's grace, the majority of them don't even remember it. It's as if it never happened. And I can say that because I look at God's heart. In this whole thing, you know, this whole question of how can a good God allow this? I am compelled to, to look at this because when you've lived with God and walked with God enough, you learn to know he can be trusted because of his heart and his character. He is pure love. And so I trust that. And even though I don't understand everything the way it is now, I trust the end. See, he knows the end. He knows the end of Lucifer. He knows the end of evil. But he also knows ours. And because of that, his, his gaze is fixed on that time. That's why he says, fix your eyes on me. You know, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. There is a joy that's set before us. And that's where we have to look, is that joy of being with him, that joy of experiencing his glory, that, that joy of knowing all of this bad stuff, it will have to take account. God already has said it. He's determined it, but he's determined for you and I to rule and to reign with him. And it's happening. I hope that this encourages you. You know, what I'm sharing here, this may not even be for you, because many of you who follow, you're already believers, and you get this. But I felt to put this here as a marker, because I do believe that in the days to come, there are going to be friends and family members, seekers, who are going to be faced with this question, and they need some help. And I'm hoping that what I have shared would give some semblance of understanding, of peace, of a confidence that God can be trusted, that he is a good God. He is a God of justice. He knows our plight, but he's already made provision. He's given us grace. That's the promise. 
even in Revelation. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And for those of us, we know this time of reigning and ruling with him is coming. This promise too in Revelation 2, 26 to 28. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him, I will give him authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. Thank you, Jesus. If you're interested in a written copy uh, form of this word, you can go to wandaalger.me where I am posting a blog with both a written version of this word as well as the video so that you can share. I would love to, to hear your comments and what the Lord is speaking to you. Is there something fresh that you're seeing that maybe you hadn't seen before? What keeps you going in this journey of faith, even in the midst of, of what we are facing? How can you, you encourage one another? Please subscribe here on YouTube or on Rumble, and please go subscribe to wandaalger.me. And if you're watching this before October 17, uh, my latest book, Words to Pray By, this is the word of God, praying the word of God, getting the word, the living word within us. This is something we need to help one another with, and especially in the days to come to disciple a whole new generation who needs to know the truth of who God is. He is good. He can be trusted. So please leave your comments, uh, leave your uh, encouragements below for one another. And more than anything, keep the faith.